think maybe you can see behind me, to the west of me, the storm's now coming in. So today, which was my day to secure some fire, I don't know what the heck's gonna happen because it looks like a real mean storm coming in. It's just a simple idea, born out of a desire to teach survival skills and share the kinds of challenges and adventures I live every year. With no survival genre on television, there was no example to follow. What I do, I do alone, and for the very first time. Younger and less sure of myself, this is the beginning of Survivor Man. An ultimate challenge, to survive in the forest for seven days. Little food, no water, no special survival gear or camping equipment. Just me and my cameras. I'm not testing the wilderness. I'm not even challenging it. I'm testing myself. My ability to survive the elements and to creatively capture it all on film, alone. <laughs> I'm not up against nature. It's not man versus wild. Me in the wild. I'm up against myself. This is the very first Survivor Man in the year 2001. There's no need to go to a jungle or desert. The northern Canadian bush can be one of the toughest places to survive on the planet, especially when things go wrong. I am familiar with these trees, the water, the rocks. It's a land of many past adventures for me. So to shake up my level of comfort, I threw a dart at a map. I knew it would land somewhere I had no prior knowledge of. Where it lands is where I make my survival stand. Out here in an area known as Wabakimi, a fisherman and hunter's paradise, until things go wrong. And you find yourself lost and alone in the deep woods. So I'm placing myself here in that role, someone lost and without supplies, needing to secure my own shelter and food. This is where it all started. Okay, folks. Okay. Take it easy. Be careful, man. I will. And with the last decaying sounds of the airplane fresh in my ears, I need to start right away with getting a good look around. It'll give me information I need to make choices and keep me calm, to mentally walk through my zones of assessment, what I have on me, what's close by, and what's farther afield. For most people, though, this is when they start to panic. They start to run through the thick bush in fear. And what do these people do? While they're crashing through the bush, for one thing, they always travel downhill, which of course where nobody's gonna see them. And what they don't do is they don't tend to make a shelter, they don't make any signals for anybody to see them, they don't build a fire, and if they do, they, they wait till the very end of the night just as it's getting dark. In fact, they've even been known to hide from their searchers, and in really bizarre cases, they've even shot at the people who are coming after them. They don't trust their compass, they doubt even the position of the sun. And the last thing they tend to do as well is sleep, ah, sleep in the middle of the day, just when everybody's trying to find them, because at night it's spooky. I gotta get out of here. On this first night, I'm opting to spend the night the same way thousands of lost victims have before me. Just to wait it out. No shelter, nothing. Just sit tight and deal with the dark as it comes in. Most people tend to travel all day long on their first day, really limiting their chances for survival. 
I'm watching some thunder and lightning rumbling to the north of this lake, which is going to make me nervous for what I might have to put up with tonight. For now, I'm going to do what most people do, which is not right, and I'm just going to... I didn't build a shelter. No shelter, I'm just going to sit here by my fire all night long. This is uh, last match. So here goes nothing. Using up my last match is a good reason to know alternate methods of fire starting. Once this fire goes out, due to rain or simple forgetfulness, there's no easy way left to secure a fire. Sleeping out under the stars may be enjoyable when you're in a sleeping bag and with friends. It's another matter when it comes to surviving this way. Well, this is pretty much how I spent the night. Mosquitoes came in pretty good at one point and for I don't know how many hours pretty much just tormented me. All I could do was hide under my jacket and hope for the cool weather which finally came. Not the cool weather but the temperatures dropped somewhere in the middle of the night and the mosquitoes kind of left. Of course then I spent the next part of the night shivering every once in a while. Whenever the fire would die down I'd wake up shivering. So with the sun just about to rise, all I feel like doing right now is, is sleeping some more, which is pretty classic because that's when the rescue is going to be coming for me is now, and yet I'll be off in the sun feeling comfortable with the darkness gone and sleeping. Stay true to form. I'll let the fire die. That was my last match last night. So from this point on, I'll be matchless and fireless. It's day two, and likely you're going through a whole new set of emotions. Perhaps guilt, stupidity, maybe even embarrassment over the predicament you're in. But it's time to sit down and take stock of what, not only what's around you, but what you have on your person. Looking at my predicament here, I've got my wallet. Well, first of all, I've got a good container here that I can use for gathering berries, perhaps even scooping water and drinking it. Yeah, heck, even the, uh, the zipper can be broken off and filed into something sharp against a rock. I've also got this little paper clip that's holding the money together. Well, instant fish hook, instant sharp implement. My set of keys, pretty much ditto for that. I can, I can take the keys, file them down. I can't stress enough that if you're gonna be out in the bush, take a Swiss Army knife with you, some sort of knife. Of course, I've got a couple of blades, can opener, that sort of thing. This saw blade's gonna come into great use when I'm working on the shelter later on. Lastly, of course, <laughs> favorite of all of this is the food I've got. So that is pretty much what I've got to work with. What I have to work with now is knowledge, so I can start to make plans for survival. This looks like it could be a good spot for a shelter for me. I've got this big natural wall on the side of me from where a tree has fallen over and lifted up the root system. I'm close to the water, I'm close to firewood, I'm close to some, a few blueberries and other berries as, as well. And that's very important. If you've got to go a long ways to get your firewood or your food or your water, and then it's not a good location for your shelter. I've got a nice, smooth kind of rock situation here that's fairly level for making my bed on. I've even got a cubby hole here where I might be able to put a, a, a little fire inside. Uh, the only downside is, is it looks like it's kind of a, a runoff area for when it rains. But if I lift myself high enough off the ground uh, to protect from that, I should be okay. I think this is going to be home. I got away lucky with no rain coming in the night before, so shelter now is vital. Too often people making a survival shelter, they get the roof up quick because that's their primary concern. They go to crawl inside and all they've got to lay on is the cold, damp ground. That can get to you really quickly. So the best thing to do is to get your bedding down first. You're going to want to use a lot of boughs because basically Three feet of boughs, when you get in, gets compressed down to about six inches of bedding by the time morning comes along. Some people will just not drink fresh water from lakes without filtering. I know enough to instead guzzle as much as possible. It takes away the feeling of hunger. This is where the saw comes in really, really handy. I tell you, it makes a big difference. If I didn't have this saw, I'd be spending a lot of calories trying to break this branch off or other branches or only be able to use smaller trees. Man, 
What a difference it makes to have a knife. I have to keep the work appropriate to the tools at hand. Small saw, small branches. Less effort wasted securing my shelter. As far as I can tell right now, I've got a thunderstorm coming in on me fairly soon. I've got to find a way of making that shelter dry, and I don't have a tarp. So anything can work, and you can find lots of different barks, or big pile of leaves also works really well, too, to shed the rain. But there's nothing that works as well as birch bark. You can make a split right down the center, and that's going to peel off as one big shingle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Haha. <laughs> Look at that. In survival, having birch trees within a short walk from my shelter location that are just the right amount of rotten so that the bark comes off easy, yet is not full of bug holes, and then to even have enough to cover my roof is very good luck. And a rare find. But then is it luck at all, when in reality I went looking for them? It's one reason why I'm not a fan of the stay put mentality if you have a good level of bush skills. I can flatten these out just by getting some heavier logs and laying them down on it to try to get a better pitch, better angle to this roof. You don't want it too flat. The water just percolates through. You want it to drain down. Once you've got the roof secured for rain, or at least you, you think you do, after that, I usually put on a couple of heavy rotten logs to deflect more rain and to weigh down the shelter, keep these guys flat. And then, basically, anything you can throw on there, throw on moss, leaves, branches, whatever you've got. Just uh, start throwing stuff on. And I've been sweating profusely all day doing this. That's the downside of when you make a shelter. You start burning up a lot of valuable, valuable calories. And uh, you've got to be careful. But by the same token, to be caught out in the elements is, uh, is worse. <laughs> When I question what to do next in a survival situation, I can't think of it as beating the odds. I have to simply take all things into consideration and then make an informed decision based on a calculated risk. I know, it sounds boring, but it is survival. I spent the entire night last night laid out on this flat rock, just laying there with my hat over top of me, being bombarded by a forest's worth of mosquitoes storm never came in. It didn't cool things down. In fact, it just got hotter. So I sweated inside my rain jacket all night long. Oh, man. I sleep here listening to the sound of the mosquitoes. I usually tuck my hands in my pocket just to get them away from the bugs. Oh, and it's a brutal experience. You can hardly breathe inside this thing, and you just sweat constantly. In all my years of wilderness stripping, that is the worst experience of mosquitoes I've ever had. I don't think I, I, I got maybe a good solid 15 minutes in total of sleep all night long. And now I think maybe you can see behind me to the west of me, the storm's now coming in. So today, which was my day to secure some fire, I don't know what the heck's gonna happen because it looks like a real mean storm coming in. Whatever my plans might be, it will be the earth, the weather, nature, that will truly decide what I can do, how I must prepare, how long I wait for fire or food, when I can leave this place and get back to the safety of civilization. This is my view of the storm. No man-made adaptation will ever be more powerful than nature itself. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, it's really coming down. That's huge chunks of hail. Thunder's cracking pretty good, lightning. Well, I'm just gonna wait this out. Even these big chunks of hail, and these guys have already been melting for about 15 minutes. They were probably, well, the ones I saw bouncing were three, four times the size. 
Even these guys taste good right now. Oh. Just to feel something cold in your mouth after two and a half days of intense, tense, intense, intense heat. Oh, it's great. Let's go see if we can find some berries. Here's the two less commonly known ones right together. Bunchberry, and this little guy here is creeping snowberry. Not huge, but a nice little uh, taste power punch. Almost minty-like. This is my one and only raspberry plant that I can find so far. Again, just like the blueberries, you can take the raspberry leaves and boil them up for tea for uh, an extra source of, uh, of nutrients. The problem of being lost and not having any food is that many of the berries look very tasty to you. Yeah, this one here, nice and blue and juicy, is, uh, is poisonous, Clintonia borealis. Mm, blueberries. I'm lucky. There's not a lot of berries in this area, but there are about five different kinds of berries fairly close to me. I'll eat them up pretty quick because, as I said, there's not too many. But I'm not going to eat them now. I'm going to leave them till about day five or so um, because right now I'm still living off my fat reserves and a little bit of energy from before. So I'm going to need those berries in a couple of days a lot more than I need them now. So I'm just going to have just two. two. Okay, all right, three or four more. Rationing while hungry is not an easy thing to do. It seems the weather is in charge so far, and it's pointless for me to try starting a fire now. This is why you get your shelter going. In the wintertime, there's the odd occasion where a fire takes precedence. But in the summertime, in this area anyway, first thing you want to have up is that shelter. Should have been up the first night, and I would have been better prepared for tonight. For today, I guess. It's up now, and I'm going to hunker in there. The bugs were insane in it last night, which is why I slept out on the rock starting to rain just now and I can't ch chance getting myself wet at all you let yourself get wet even a bit hypothermia can sink in even in the summertime even in the fall people link hypothermia usually only to the winter most cases happen in the fall and in the spring and this is August in far far uh, northern Ontario in the boreal forest Canadian Shield I could get hypothermic now if I don't stay dry which the rain's here now, so that's what I'm gonna go do. I'm uh, fairly dry. I've gotta tuck my legs in to keep them dry. But it's really coming down out there. At least I know I'm fairly low. I'm not out on a point or attached to a big tall tree. Pretty important since uh, lightning's been hitting pretty hard. It's a good thing that I raised this shelter up on top of some rotted logs and then put the spruce boughs down because already I've got a river flowing underneath me. You have no choice in a situation like this but to hold tight. start looking for some things to uh, to get my fire going. I've got a ways to walk around and see if I can get the right ingredients for the fireball. When you start walking through the bush, if you're going to leave your campsite, you want to make sure you really notice everything. Look around all the time. Walk slowly and deliberately. Step uh, over top of things. Don't jump on things. Good way to twist an ankle. And whenever possible, blaze your trail, like perhaps either taking a branch and, and purposely breaking it in a particular direction, or if you've got a knife or an ax, mark a, a blaze on the tree on both sides. People mark it usually on the side they're going, and they forget to mark it on the side for when they're coming back so they can see where they've got to get back to, both sides of the tree. Yeah, hopefully I won't get lost. Now, I need some cedar and some poplar. Careful not to injure yourself when you're doing this. So the first thing I want to find is a, is a spindle, maybe six to eight inches long, and uh, as straight as I can find it. Just 
get that off. Okay, so I've got my spindle, and I'll have to clean it up and carve it a little bit straighter than that. The next piece of your fire bow is actually the bow part. And pretty much any kind of branch will do, as long as it's, um, oh boy, as long as it's strong enough and curved. Now right here by my shelter, uh, all these upturned roots, a lot of them of course are, are bent. This one's probably a little too, too weak, but I can try it later if it, this one doesn't work. But I like the shape of this guy up here, so. So at last I've put together the essential elements for a fire bow. I've got my spindle all ready to go and uh, just uh, hopefully shaped nicely and smooth enough. I've got the fire bow now, which the root's probably gonna work out. I carved a couple of notches in uh, around the, uh, the end so that I can tie this leather lace on, which came, of course, from my boot. The baseboard, in this case, is just this cedar branch. And lastly is the bearing block to hold it down. This is trial number one. Wish me luck. getting smoke, but my notch is not close enough to the hole. The dust is just scattering around. <laughs> oh man, I'm not getting it yet. Oh God, that's hot. That's hot enough to ignite. Jeez. Oh, so close. All right, my boot lace is broken. Gotta keep trying. Ah. Oh my God. All right, well, now I'm in trouble. I've doubled the, the boot lace to uh, hopefully make it stronger. Boy, this is one of the toughest I've ever had to do. And, uh, you know, I've done hundreds of these fires. But this setup is not optimum. It's not working for me for some reason. To add to my problems, it's reaching record-breaking heat this day so I have to stop often and gorge on water. Oh God, so close. This time, I gotta take a break. String broke. Down to one string. Feeling like I'm failing at getting a fire going by using wood friction, I've decided to change up the wood material 
to see if that can make a difference. It took a long time to get this split and, and this into shape. Basically, I was dealing with a branch that was this big. Come on now. Take this time. With this many hours put into the effort, I'm drawing on my last energy reserves to make this happen. And it's breaking me down. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so close. So close. Squeaking is never a good sound when it comes to the fireball, yet I somehow seem to be getting better results after way too many hours of trying. Man. That's the best one so far. Hang on. That one's really close. But my sp spindle's slipping all the time. I gotta work on this again. And then it happened. As I got up to move the camera, I noticed a small wisp of smoke. I had indeed finally gotten a small ember from the last combination of wood. And there's no way I was gonna lose this one. It's very important here that I don't jump up. Because I could kick everything flying. It's very tender. Okay. All right. I gotta be really gentle. At this moment, this bundle is everything. <laughs> yes, yes. Ha 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 ha. Oh my God, that was tough. I've never had so much trouble getting a fire going. Oh yeah. Woo! I have created fire. Oh yeah. I'd like to thank the Academy. I'd like to thank Cedar. I'd like to thank Poplar, Birch Bark, and Spanish Moss. Yes. What a difference this is gonna make. Couple of things, psychologically, heat, and uh, now, if I'm able to catch any, uh, well, if I have to eat leeches or snails or anything, at least I can cook them up, kill any parasites that might exist with them. But now, I'm gonna try my hardest to catch some fish, and, uh, or maybe a mouse or something like that. Oh, man, that was tough. expecting to spend last night laying out on the rock and being tormented by mosquitoes as I have every other night. So I decided to come up and sit by the fire and sit in the smoke and hopefully they wouldn't hassle me too much there. But something surprising happened. The temperature seemed to drop just a bit 
and the stars came out and the mosquitoes cooled off a little bit and left me alone. So I just laid here by the fire all night long and I discovered something, a sense of familiarity. Now, it's deeply psychologically comforting to have a sense of familiarity out here. I'm certainly not familiar with laying on the rocks and letting mosquitoes torment me all night long. Heck, I, at one point I even looked up and, and there was northern lights on one side of the sky and a full moon on the other side of the sky. It made a big difference for me to get through a night like that. It's time to work on a signal fire so a plane can spot me from the sky. Back at home, they won't have any idea where I may have ended up. Having some form of cordage out here is pretty important. In fact, whenever I go tripping, I carry tons of excess rope. You know, you can make cordage, and I've found that out here that spruce roots work really well. It's very, very strong. I've taken the spruce roots, and I've tied around from pole to pole, tied up at the top and uh, for strength. And then I've done a, like a lacing with some more spruce roots across the bottom to create like a, a, net, a mesh on the bottom and also on the sides so that stuff doesn't blow out of the sides. I'll do the same across the front once I'm, once I'm done. But the next uh, stage basically is to get all my birch bark and all of my uh, um, tinder and stuff like that and to shove it in there and get it all in there uh, with lots dangling down at the bottom uh, so that it's ready to go. With fire, shelter, and signaling taken care of, I notice my hunger starting to preoccupy my thoughts. It's time to do something about it. So, I'm trying to occupy my mind and, uh, and get busy with some stuff, making a figure four deadfall here. And I catch us some food. Damn. Ow! On the end right here, hopefully the mouse comes along, gives a little nibble, and I get dead mouse. You know, some people have had to do some pretty outrageous things to survive an ordeal. Consider the person who, if they had a canoe, might paddle across to that island over there and set it on fire so someone would spot it. Or someone who chops down or burns down a hydro pole so workers would be forced to come out to find out what the trouble is. Illegal? Oh yeah, definitely. But survival is about doing whatever it is you need to do to live. It's not pretty, it's not comfortable, it's not fun, it's ugly, and it's never a game. The old saying is, better to be tried by 12 than carried by six. You know, I felt something really interesting today that I wasn't expecting, and yet a lot of lost victims do say they feel it. Boredom. I was just getting really bored today. And uh, it, it happens, and you've got to get your mind occupied. I mean, the fire was done, the shelter was okay, the signal tower was done, and, uh, and the boredom crept in. And you know what that can do to people. It can be really dangerous. So you need to start occupying your mind. So now I'm starting to whittle away and carve at little deadfalls and snares to set up and see if I can procure maybe a little bit of meat, get a bit of protein into my diet. Anyway, I can hear the mosquito hum starting again, so maybe I'm lucky and I won't, I can be like last night, not have to wrap myself up in this raincoat again. Ah. Keeping my contact lenses clean, fixing my camera gear, and setting up to film. It's the little things. They're all still part of the challenge of what must be accomplished if this week is to be a success. Mostly, though, what I'm here to do is survive. Morning of day six, and a little tense this morning. I had to come out and make sure the fire was still going after I got a bit of a sprinkling last night. I thought I'd put out enough logs, but I wasn't sure. Just able to keep it going. There's a mixed bag of weather going on right now. There's rain clouds and blue sky. So the priority is gonna to be to keep this fire going, and of course, as always, so throw another couple of big logs on top of it. The weather continues to remain in control of the situation. The thunder's rumbling like crazy in the distance. So uh, 
I think I'm gonna play it safe and bring my fire inside. I actually uh, put a big rotting stump on the outside fire to protect it from the rain and act kind of like an umbrella, which is what the, uh, I, I was in Northern Quebec with the Mistassini, in Mistassini with the Cree, and that's what they did. They take big uh, punky logs and put it over top of their fire before a torrential downpour, and uh, the fire would keep going. I've trimmed all of the top here, got away all the hanging pieces, things that are gonna burn, stuff like that. And uh, I've got all my twigs and branches and everything ready. Now, pretty much stick with small thumb-sized uh, sticks for this, maybe long ones. But uh, the problem with this fire is you are having to feed it pretty much constantly. And uh, that's why the big stumpy, or big stump, the big rotting stump uh, works really well. That rain is coming. The sky is very black over there. Oh, I'm gonna get rained on again. With rain and wind, my constant companions during this survival ordeal, I have no other option but to try to work within the flow of weather. Try to survive alongside of it rather than fight against it. Yet still, there are a few little survival tricks that can help keep me alive. I'm in here somewhere. Just a couple of big punky logs laid over top of my fire and just let to smolder and, and burn underneath and uh, pouring rain. It just poured on me, torrential downpour with thunder and lightning for about an hour and a half straight. And it has opened up to one big, beautiful sky, all blue. And my fire's still going. A lot of survival books go on about catching big game. I haven't even seen a, a mouse, let alone a grouse. And I saw one caribou and a flock of ducks, but they didn't really want to come over and, and uh, visit me. So, so you're left with uh, the main fare, a uh, snail and two leeches, or as I like to affectionately call them, lunch and dinner. It's not much, but at this point, the power bar is long ago eaten and now six days without food, it at least is something, something to focus on, to spend some time on, to keep my mind focused, and as little as it is, something to eat. Here we have it, a meal fit for a king. It's disgusting looking, but it's protein. So this is what's left of my snail after uh, first cooking it on a stick and then putting it on a, a rock to finish frying up there. It doesn't look like much, it'll have to do. And it goes. Well, I'm stuffed. How about some leech dessert? Here we have it, my sun-dried and smoked two leeches, ready for the eating. Well, what are the realities of this situation? The realities are that trying for fish or big game, even squirrels, is a very difficult process. Don't expect to uh, be lost for a couple of days and be bringing home some major meat unless you've got some gear with you. When you have nothing, it's very difficult. Fishing with a two and a half foot line twisted off my shirt, it's not very ideal, even though I just saw a huge pike swimming right beside the shore. So you're left with well, as I read one time, you're left with the gots twos. There's the wants twos and the gots twos. There's the wants twos, the stuff is the stuff that you want to eat. And then there's the stuff that you gotta eat. Because you need sustenance. Hmm. A little crispy. Hmm. Tastes like chicken. Even this far north, there are wild edible greens I can take advantage of. And getting to them in the lake means protecting my clothes so that I'm dry at night, lest I bring on hypothermia in the dark. I know these particular tubers are not very tasty, but they are a good source of starch and nutrients. These rocks have been in the fire for a long time. They're red hot. And I'm putting them inside the hat here full of water. I've got the blueberry leaves. I've got raspberry leaves. I've got... Um, some uh, Labrador tea leaves, and I'm trying to get this to boil. 
This hot rock method for boiling water comes from the earliest of human food heating methods. I don't want to burn my hat. It's not a rolling boil by any means, but uh, it might be enough to do the job. Well, I've got about three or four cups of uh, stew here, or liquid anyway. What I'll do is drink, the, when it cools, I'll drink the liquid for the, the tea factor. I've got the Labrador tea in there, the peppermint, or not the peppermint, I wish there was peppermint in there, the blueberry and the raspberry. But I also put in the, the uh, this stuff here. I cut up the, uh, ouch, the pond lily tubers. So uh, let's see what that's like. It's soft anyway. Now see, I had pond lily tubers one time before. It was terrible, it was very bitter. We just roasted it in the fire. That's edible, totally edible. It's kind of bland, touch of bitterness to it, but it's full of starch. And uh, I could use some of that right now. With my time here coming to a close, I'll need to watch the skies for my ticket to safety. I knew they would come for me today. I knew they would try to find me, and I was confident they would on this easy to notice bare rock. Yet still, the feeling of being found is one of elation. Wait, got breath? Woo! The triangle tripod formation held up really well in the storm. It was blown on all night. I thought it was going to blow over, but it stood straight and strong. The boughs helped to shed the rain so the birch bark wasn't so wet. And I couldn't get this. This survival experience and the filming of it set in motion a multi-year chain of events. Yet the entire story is, can I survive? Can I endure the elements and find my way? Procure my own food? Create fire? Exist far from any of the advantages of civilization? Could I survive like my ancestors once did? entirely dependent upon the land. These questions are universal in their appeal, yet the answer is simple. I can. We all can. And whether we think it or not, our very survival is dependent entirely on the land, the water, the oceans, the planet. Survival will always be a universal concern. This week-long experience only broke it down to its simplest form, one person, alone, surviving.